the idea of a book is incredibly hardy. Uh, uh, over the years, books have taken lots of forms. Books were oral, then they were scrolls, and then they were codices, so bound, bound books that were hand copied, and then they were bound books that were printed. Um, and today we have the idea of an ebook, which is a pretty nebulous thing. Um, ebooks can be uh, a few words long, they can be as long as Wikipedia, which, you know, to, if you printed it out, would fill whole rooms. Um, they can have lots of media in them and so on. I think we don't know yet what an electronic book is as opposed to a book that's merely in electronic form um, because we've yet to really find a very successful kind of electronic book that can only be represented electronically and that if you tried to turn it into a print book wouldn't work and I think that's the, that's something that is properly an electronic book. Now I say that and at the same time, we have things like Wikipedia, which are arguably books. You know, at least they replace a thing that was a book, um, and that that are so far removed from the boundaries of the printed page uh, that it is really hard to imagine them working as a printed book. So maybe Wikipedia is like the first cut of a genuinely electronic book, a book that isn't just pouring the old wine into a new bottle, but is a, a, an altogether new kind of thing. As to libraries, um, I think that uh, libraries have never merely been a place where books were accumulated. Libraries have always been about teaching people how to navigate the authority in knowledge to answer their own questions as well as they can. Libraries have always been about access to all human knowledge. And one of the jobs that librarians did was try to winnow the chaff from the wheat. Try to go through all of the things that were printed and find the ones that are worthy or that, that are significant or that people should be looking at or, or that people might find a real answer in. Um, and you know that problem of figuring out which things are worthy has gotten much harder because there's so much information available. And we really only have one group of people in the world who've devoted themselves to, to solving that problem year in, year out for centuries, and that's librarians. And so as the problem of figuring out how to navigate authority, how to figure out what the, the best answer is, not just any answer or the first answer, but the best answer is to any question you have becomes more complex, librarians are more needed than ever. And so I really think that librarians have a, a robust future. I think that it's, um, we live in an age of austerity, fairly manufactured austerity, where, where a very small number of people have accumulated an ungodly amount of wealth at the expense of a wider society, and that because nobody wants to talk about that, instead we talk about the idea that public spending is out of control because the rich have accumulated all of the money and refuse to pay any tax on it. Um, and so we talk about libraries as though they were a luxury, but libraries are anything but a luxury. Libraries are one of the kind of hallmarks of a civilized society. And the talk about shutting down libraries is unnecessary in the 21st century is, to my mind, a very ideological proposition. And it's an ideological proposition that says we should let the affluent off the hook for being part of the wider society and, and, and giving back in the same way that, that poor people do, than giving back uh, comparable portions of their income to poor people, uh, as poor people do. I kind of think that the debate that we're having right now about computers is a debate about whether a computer's default posture should be yes master or I can't let you do that Dave and um, I'm on the I, I'm on the yes master side and I'm on I'm against the I can't let you do that Dave uh, side not because people don't do stupid things with their computers because they do and not because people don't son sometimes harden themselves by doing stupid things with their computers because they do and not because um, it wouldn't help those people sometimes if the computers were smart enough to disobey their orders. It's that making a computer that is capable of disobeying its owner, even if the owner wants to override that, um, is very hard and not, um, it doesn't really have any basis in theory. There's no, there's no computer science theory that describes a computer that can run every program except for the one that we don't like. 
Um, all we have are computers that can run all the programs, but that have some other program that's watching everything that goes on and that tries to interdict the stuff you're not supposed to be doing or the stuff that, that's prohibited. And since that program, the, the watchdog program, the I can't let you do that day program, is not something that people want by definition. Nobody, nobody wants a computer that when you say, I, want, I really want to do this, your computer says, no, 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 you really don't. You just think you do. Nobody wants that. Um, and anyone who, has, who runs up against that in their computer will try and find the program that's trying to stop them from doing this and sort of drag it into the trash or kill its process then in order to make that model work, you have to design computers that sometimes don't accurately report what files are on their drives and what processes they're running. And as soon as you do that, as soon as you make a computer that sometimes lies to its owner, you invite all kinds of mischief. You invite other people to figure out how to exploit that facility for lying to the computer's owner, to hide all manner of things that can harm that computer's owner. And you know, computers aren't just our laptops and our phones. They're our implanted defibrillators. They're the firmware that connects our brakes to the actual brake shoes in the car. They're the, the software that flies the 747. All of these things are, are um, made out of general purpose computers. And it is generically just not a good idea to weaken those computers' security by teaching them to lie to the people who are operating them. Because you can imagine all the mischief that you can get up to, not just by spying on someone through their phone or listening in on their conversations, but, but by you know, putting the brakes down when they want to run the accelerator or vice versa, or delivering lethal shocks through their defibrillator, or you know, messing with, with air traffic control signals and telling the plane that the ground is actually 10 feet lower than it really is so that the, the plane doesn't deploy the wheels and, and continues to descend after it hits the dirt. Um, all of those things are the kinds of scenarios that you want to prevent, and preventing those starts with making computers that aren't designed to hide things from their owners. So I think that we are uh, getting our heads around the idea of universality or general purposeness in a way that we've never had to, to grapple with before. I mean, we've always had general purpose machines. Um, famously, the, the Greeks had the, the simple machines, the pulley and the lever and so on. But those universal machines, the wheel, were um, very simple. In fact, uh, general purposeness and simplicity have been bound together both in our, our national or, or species-wide conception and also in our regulatory frameworks. Uh, lawmakers don't typically try to regulate wheels to solve social problems. You know, no one's, no one's ever said, well, given that every bank robber drives away from the robbery with, on a car with four wheels on it, what can we do to engineer wheels that are bank robber proof? Um, but uh, when things are complicated, they're generally thought of as special purpose and inherently regulatable. Like you can say, well, you know, people have accidents when they drive uh, cars while talking on the phone. We can mandate that cars can't have phones in them. And nobody, you know, people might argue with whether or not that will solve the problem, but nobody says, well, once you remove the phone from the car, it ceases to be a car. It's not doing, you know, disfiguring violence to the underlying utility of an automobile. Um, computers are a kind of weird intersection of complexity and general purposeness. A, a computer has this funny property which computer scientists have called Turing completeness or, or you know, uh, universality, which is that a, a computer built in accord with the, with the theory of computing as we understand it since the time of Alan Turing in the 1940s is a device that can execute all instructions that can be expressed in symbolic language, every instruction. Not every instruction except for the one that allows you to operate a car phone, every instruction. And as I said before, there is no way to remove one instruction from all the instructions that your computer can execute. The closest approximation is to install spyware on a computer. And since computers, due to this general purposeness, have infiltrated every corner of our lives, there, um, uh, there are many people who think that they can solve problems by removing features from computers. You know, computers are at the heart of all of our problems because computers are at the heart of everything we do. And so there's this idea of solving problems by, by, by breaking computers. And um, 
I, th I think we are finally just now starting to come to grips with the idea that the computer is general purpose and that the network that connects it, the, the internet, is a general purpose network, an end-to-end -end universal network that allows any two parties to communicate with each other using any protocol without any third party being able to intervene in that. And, and those two ideas, the general purpose computer and the end-to-end -end network, are profound and I think are the organizing metaphor of the 21st century and maybe the centuries beyond it.